We are live now. Good to go, ma'am. Good evening, friends. On behalf of Radhatri Netralaya and Intas, I am Dr. Vasumati Vedantam, and it is my pleasure to welcome all of you on this exciting webinar on diabetic macular edema, past, present, and future: gold standards, current concepts, and anticipated advances. Without much ado, it is my pleasure to invite my esteemed colleague, Dr. Rajiv Raman. head or a senior vitreoretinal consultant of uh, shankar netralaya and he will be talking for 8 minutes on how the systemic status influences diabetic macular edema rajiv thanks vasavati i'll just share my screen is my screen visible hello is my screen visible can somebody tell it's visible it's visible yes, rajiv yeah thanks thanks vasumati for this uh, organizing such a nice webinar on a important topic of dme and next couple of minutes i'll be sharing uh, some of the views on diabetic macular edema what are the influence of systemic factors so there are a couple of systemic factors which can play a role and i'll just touch on all of them in a very short way because we have it's a 8 minute talk so glycemic control definitely is a important factor as far as dme con uh, concern and let's see what happens to response of anti vegf is there any anti diabetic which is best for dme a word about metabolic memory and what should be the cut offs of glycemic control for injection so we have a mixed amount of mixed evidence from clinical trials on the role of glycemic control so if you see the trials which were done couple of years back the protocol i and the rise and right trials they didn't find any uh, relationship between hba1c and the treatment response in dme but the newer trials the protocol t vivid vista they did find that there is a association of people who have poor glycemic control tend to do a little poor as far as anti vegf response to dme is concern uh is there any anti diabetic which is good there are some evidence like sitagliptin the dpp4 uh, agonist they have a little benefit but again more in animals not shown in uh, good, good amount of human trials today the status is all anti diabetic seem to be good there is no extra benefit of one agent over another however you must realize that definitely whenever there is a strict control of diabetes there is worsening of retinopathy and so this is not only seen in type 1 diabetes whenever you initiate the insulin even when there is switching from a oral hypoglycemic agent to insulin in type 2 they develop it how many will develop so in type 1 the reports are nearly about 13% will develop worsening in type 2 whenever there is switching from oral hypoglycemic to insulin all of them develop some amount of uh, worsening so this is something you should keep in mind but in long term nearly about 6 years definitely it has got advantage in terms of reducing the progression of retinopathy a word about metabolic memory so this was actually uh, uh, the observation done in dcct trial where they had type 1 diabetes they had a intensive control and a conventional control arm and this study ended and after few years 10 years later they again followed them called as a edix study and what they found that people who had a very good intensive treatment who were randomized in that arm in the initial study they had less retinopathy even after 10 years so they found that there is some amount of protection which is uh, which is there because of a tight glycemic control in the initial part of the diabetes and they termed it as metabolic memory in type 2 diabetes ukpds also did the same thing they had a follow up study they also found a similar effect and they termed it as a legacy effect and more recently we now know that these metabolic memory and legacy effects seem to be because of altered expression of retinal glucose transporter 1 in the brain now why this is important because once we have or know the mechanism probably there may be treatment which may give a a memory in the early phase of diabetic retinopathy so our diabetes they don't develop retinopathy this is something we will see in coming years 
another thing about uh, glycemic control is the use of glitazones now some years back this glitazones were banned because of the systemic side effect but again now it has come people are using it in india it is approved and these are associated with things so they themselves can cause macular edema so if you have a macular edema which is not responding well look definitely into the medications they are taking especially if they are on insulin type 2 diabetes definitely and glitazone combination can cause macular edema now as far as cutoffs in uk they believe in hba1c so they have less than 8.5 we follow what we do for cataract surgeries less than 200 random blood sugar we uh, we inject definitely there is advantage of using a hba1c cutoff however there are problems because if you have a hba1c of 9 9.5 and you no know, we, we the pro- advantage of rbs is we can control and give it here we really don't know when it will come medical legal issues are also there so that's something which currently the rbs is used as a cut off in india to give injections now dme in hypertensives one is we need to differentiate whether it is hypertensive retinopathy or a diabetic retinopathy we need to know whether diabetic macular edema is a bit different in hypertensive what is influence of bp on dme whether it has got a, a effect on response to treatment and what should be the cut off levels so you can see both look pretty alike a moderate hypertensive retinopathy or a moderate non proliferative diabetic retinopathy but there are certain features which gives you clue so if you get cluster of microaneurysms in the macular area more towards diabetic retinopathy intra retinal hemorrhages the ones which are again dot and blot hemorrhages more towards diabetic retinopathy arteriolar changes in hypertension venular dilatation in diabetic retinopathy if you have those flame shaped hemorrhages superficial hemorrhages more towards hypertensive multiple cotton wool spots again hypertensive so in real world you don't see a very clear differentiation majority of time you will find both the features together is uh, morphology different as far as dme is concerned so there are studies which have shown that systemic hypertension is inversely associated with macular thickness in majority of the subfields especially in those who also have dysglycemia it's also inversely related to choroidal thickness and one of our study which we did we try we found nsd neurosensory detachment in dme one of the risk factor was a high mean systolic and diastolic blood pressure independent risk factor for nsd is there any influence of bp on the response of treatment one of the thing studies and couple of studies have shown that it's not bp but it's the pulse pressure so if you see a macular edema which is spontaneously variating the variations are seen it is coming down next time again increasing very quickly so these spontaneous variations in cmt is related to pulse pressure and definitely bp control has a benefit as far as incidence of retinopathy is concerned and progression of retinopathy also and one must realize what i should told about uh, blood sugar you don't have a similar metabolic memory for blood pressure again response of therapy we really don't have very clear evidence that whether controlling bp will have effect on the anti vegf response or a steroid response but we have some uh, Uh, evidences which are there not a very direct evidence mead study the steroid study the ozodex one in their sham arm they did find in their subgroup analysis that absence of history of hypertension was associated with a greater improvement of vcb uh, we it is a indirect measure in the same study they also found that those who have more anti hypertensive medication probably they are better controlled they had a better improvement in central retinal thickness but these are indirect evidences we really don't have a direct evidence that bp can influence as far as cutoffs for injection we must realize about this term called as hypertensive urgency where the bp uh, is elevated 180 by 110 to 180 120 without any signs of end organ damage why it's important to realize this definition because 2% of them Uh, uh of them they die within 4 years so that's something you want to avoid again there are studies which suggest that 
nearly 20 to 30 percent of the people during injection can develop hypertensive urgency. And they also found that it's the age and discomfort for after the last injection they were associated with. The, so it's important that injection should be a pleasant experience for the patient. But as far as cutoff is concerned, a systolic BP of less than 180 millimeter mercury and diastolic less than 110 should be reasonable. It's again query, but yes, it's good to monitor during the injection period too. The next systemic problem I will discuss would be renal problems. Again, the questions are, does the renal macular edema present different, differently with people with renal problems? Is it safe to use intravitreal anti-VEGF? How reliable are the OCT thicknesses? And is there any effect of dialysis or renal transplant? So we do know that they present sometime with ischemic, a very we do a subtle looking, nothing uh, featureless retina or a massive exudation, more of peripapillary cotton wool spots, even in, in uh, uh, the patients with renal problem. OCT, they do have more of neurosensory detachment with or without uh, edema in the, uh, in the other part, the, uh, the sense neurosensory retina. So they may have a diffuse edema with neurosensory detachment. Is it safe to inject? This was a recent, uh, I will not say recent, 2019, probably end of that, this is a evidence which came from the Nephrology Society. And they said that it's not a contraindication, but if a person is on injections, anti-VEGF injections, and during follow-up, you see an increase in creatinine and BUN more than 25%, increase in blood pressure, and urine protein creatinine ratio is also increasing. These are the cases where you can, they say reduce the dose, but we do know that we don't reduce, but they suggested switch on to uh, safer alternative. And in this article, they spoke, it's ranibizumab or pagat. So ranibizumab is a safer, which they suggest. Uh, this is from the Nephrology Society. But however, what you should keep in mind that if there is a, a decline in the renal function over a period of time, when you are injecting, be a bit cautious in injecting these patients. How reliable are the OCT thickness parameters in them? One of the things which is seen is, the, so you have a chronic kidney disease and you have the early stages and the late stage of chronic kidney disease, the stage four and stage five, you get thinning of retina. And the initial stages, it's like OCT parameters like any DME, except that they have more of neurosensory detachment. However, in these cases, those who are on dialysis and they have renal problem don't rely more on the central retinal thickness. So anyway, we don't rely, but UK, they have a cutoff 300. So that becomes a problem because uh, meaningful change in OCT thickness is actually 10%, 10 to 11%. They say that if there is a change, you can decide whether your anti vegf is acting or not. But in these cases who are on dialysis, there is also a more of diurnal variation. So these cases, you should not rely on only thickness in giving the injections. What is the effect of dialysis? Dialysis actually has more effect on the choroidal compartment rather than the retinal circulation. Uh, and very conflicting reports. Some say that it shows reduction. Some say macular edema, no effect of dialysis. But uniformly, multiple studies have shown that the first dialysis, when the dialysis has just started, these are the cases, definitely there is a reduction of this interretinal thickness. So when the patient is shifted to a dialysis, macular edema will reduce. Subsequent, we really cannot say. And when you are planning dialysis, again, just for the reason uh, that probably the spill off in the circulation may get, uh, can get removed by dialysis, you can plan dialysis after anti VEGF injection. What is the effect of transplant on macular edema? So, this was our study, which was published in IGO, a 12 year st follow up study it definitely improves diabetic macular edema and diabetic retinopathy. However, you must also realize that one of the immunosuppressants which is used after renal transplant, Fingolimit, they also use it now in multiple sclerosis. That is something which can also cause macular edema like the glutazons. And those who had combined renal pancreas transplantation, they actually, again, it is like sudden lowering of blood sugar. So they will develop macular edema, peripapillary soft exudates, you should keep that in mind. Now, this is something which renal test you should look at when you see the reports. 
this was a very recent last week published one of our study with mv diabetes where we tried looking at a large population of uh, patient nearly 12000 patients longitudinal study and we tried correlating the renal markers with diabetic retinopathy and what we found that the best thing to look at especially when you are trying to look for pdr it is the estimated gfr and when you are looking at macular edema it is urine albumin to creatinine ratio so i think these are the two parameters you should look for whenever you are trying to look for dme and pdr now cva cva uh, actually diabetes itself american diabetes association tells it as a coronary event so uh, diabetes is a risk factor and we also know that diabetic retinopathy is a microangiopathy is also associated macrovascular changes in diabetes that also increases the risk and they are as the retinopathy happens in eye the similar risk is also there for a small vessel occlusion in the brain and kidneys there are also evidence that those who have uh, dme they are more risk of having stroke and myocardial infarction and as such even without diabetes a person with stroke myocardial infarction 10% of them even if he is a non diabetic have they have retinal lesions like micro hemorrhages or cotton wool spots so keeping all these picture in mind dme does have a role or cardiovascular events and they are linked to some way or the other and current guideline is that avoid anti vegf if there is a recent stroke recent is how recent last 3 months and if a patient has experienced during his anti vegf treatment he has a stroke and you are it is 3 months is over and you are planning to inject definitely you should inform him and that is something educate the patient that this can increase the risk coming to anemia yes anemia again is something we found a very high risk uh, it's an independent risk factor for retinopathy and we know when there is anemia there is ischemia and hypoxia again vegf and all these factors play a role there probably may worsen macular edema or pdr <clears throat> erythropoietin is something which is used for treatment of anemia especially if it is of renal cause and these cases when the patient is on erythropoietin it's a double edged weapon so it increases new vessel formation so patient who is on moderate and severe non proliferative can convert to a proliferative retinopathy but it's advantage in dme so erythropoietin a mild macular edema with uh, you no know, your erythropoietin just observe the the uh, macular edema will reduce there are also some evidence not exactly in diabetic retinopathy but a cat study in cnvm the amd study they did find that those who are on iron supplements they had more retinal hemorrhages how true this was again in a dose dependent fashion and how true it is in dme or or, or diabetic retinopathy has not been analyzed coming to lipids again is oct different in these who have a different uh, a uh, dyslipidemia so those who are diabetes without retinopathy definitely it is known that ldl cholesterol is linked with central subfield thickness and central macular volume and there is increase in total cholesterol that causes a higher total macular volume not the csmt or csmv meaning that probably it has a role in a non center involving dme and with center involving dme they don't they didn't find any uh, significant association as far as the, the oct this is just about, about the oct i'm telling probably this suggests that lipid lowering drugs may have a role in non center involving dme however very elegantly dr amod gupta and group had also shown that uh, using statins in type 2 diabetes with this lipidemia massive exudation it does help in clearing them you must also think, realize that yeah just last two three slides yeah, okay. ldl cholesterol and triglycerides are independently associated with hard exudate area and triglyceride is more likely to have higher triglyceride having more hard exudate in the macular area infections i'll just skip keto diet keep in mind that these are the keto diet and bariatric patients they have sudden reduction of uh, glycer sudden uh, uh, euglycemia and they will have worsening of retinopathy 
Sleep apnea is one of the factors you should look at whenever there is a refractory diabetic macular edema. So in conclusion, systemic factors does play a very important role in managing DME. And it's not only ophthalmologist, you need to do tandem work with a diabetologist and nephrologist. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Raji, for an exhaustive presentation on DME and systemic status. Always a pleasure to listen to you. It's now my uh, pleasure to invite uh, another esteemed colleague of mine, the head of the Vitruretinal Services of Aravind Madurai, uh, uh, Aravind Chennai, I beg your pardon, Dr. Anand Rajendran. And uh, he will be presenting on FFA and wide field ocular imaging in diabetic macular edema. Anand. Uh, so can you hear me? Yes, we can hear yes, you. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. yeah, so thank you again, Vasmati. It's a pleasure to be part of this webinar. I'll be talking on DME, FFA, and UF funders imaging. Uh, yeah, so uh, is the light going out on FFA? Well, it is invasive. It is, there is potential to harm. It's time consuming, OCT angiography, uh, the new kid on the block is all pervading, especially for macular disease. However, the erstwhile advantages of fluorescein angiography does hold. It portrays function, leakage from new vessels, highlights uh, non-perfusion. In its new after wide field angiography, it is particularly making a comeback. Uh, the Academy in its preferred practice patterns uh, put out its take on fluorescein angiography and they said that it can be done or should be done cases to guide laser treatment in uh, uh, CSME to evaluate unexplained visual loss to identify suspected but clinically obscure retinal neovascularization. Where it should not be done is to screen a patient with minimal or no diabetic retinopathy. And uh, the ICO guidelines also reflected and echo the same sentiment. They said clearly that fluorescein angiography is not required to diagnose diabetic retinopathy, PDR, or DME, all of which are clinical findings. Now, ETDR has uh, uh, defined the role of fluorescein angiography in DME very well. They uh, established that fluorescein angiography guided focal laser to be used for treatment of leaking uh, microaneurysms in focal macular edema and grid laser for diffuse uh, diabetic macular edema. Now, fluorescein angiography also helps us uh, differentiate uh, DME of a diffuse nature, the diffuse leakage seen clearly on fluorescein angiography, as you can see here, and to differentiate from pseudophagic CME wherein you will find the classic petaloid peripheral pattern of fluorescein leakage. And sometimes this can overlay uh, mild DME. This is very important, especially in cases of uh, diabetic patients going in for cataract surgery, which we see a lot nowadays. Fluorescein angiography also key uh, imaging modality uh, in a case like this, where you see a sclerosed arterial in the macula, and it helps confirm what you suspect, the macular ischemia. And it also sh uh, it might show up uh, ischemia in the periphery. Lot hemorrhages in the macula, Alongside convol spots is also another soft sign of macular ischemia and fluorescein helps uncover that. A few atypical scenarios where fluorescein helps, uh, example like this, uh, where sometimes posterior pole uh, ischemia can lead on to rarely macular nevascularization and fluorescein helps uh, confirm that. Another atypical case uh, of a patient with uh, uh, non-proliferative uh, diaphragm retinopathy severe with uh, CSCR, this can happen sometimes, and it's been variably called uh, diabetic retinal pigment epiliopathy, diffuse retinal pigment epiliopathy. Uh, this case was a case of a 54 year old male, eight years in depth on oral hyperglycemics, uh, uh, 624 vision in the left eye, and the background severe and PDR. As you can see on the OCT, is a good amount of subretinal fluid. You can see that PED there, which is a giveaway sign, and a bit of subretinal uh, uh, fibrin in the background. A month later, you see post avastin. That subretinal fluid is gone, but the subretinal fibrin has actually increased. A month later, you see that there's a significant decrease in the subretinal fibrin, and um, the fluorescein angiography is a clincher here. You see that diffuse DME uh, leakage, but you also importantly see that little bit of uh, uh, that uh, implant kind of leak just below the phobia, and that in the later phases, it actually uh, gets distorted because of the subretinal fibrin. Uh, patient was counted for PDT, because vision was okay, he went for conservative management. A month and a half later came massive amount of subretinal fibrin. You can see the vision has dropped significantly. And on the angiogram, you can see that the uh, leakage has now actually moved over into the macular area too. Fortunately, patient accepted and underwent PDT now. And two months later, you can see that subretinal fibrin coalesced on the coagulum. 
the clinical sequence from baseline with increasing subarachnoid fibrin to the point where PDT had to be done for a massive amount, then the remarkable resolution. Mastoid dialysis is another case, uh, atypical scenario. It's a patient where we suspect advanced diabetic retinopathy in a 68 year old lady who had come in for cataract surgery with poor vision. And uh, uh, fluorescent angiography magically uncovered the pathology and showed it up to the case of PDR with macular ischemia. Optos with sulfide field angiography uses SLO technology, has an ellipsoid mirror which contains two focal points. The laser is passed through the first focal point. And the second focal point is virtually placed on the iris plane, therefore giving us about 200 degrees of view. It uses two lasers, the green laser for, uh, uh, for anterior retinal structure imaging and uh, red laser penetrates deep into the red and coronal layers. The ultra wide field flushing, uh, 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 photographs shows a 3.2 times more retinal area than your regular fundus photographs and 3.9 times more retinal area on angiography as compared with the standard 70 photographs where you might miss uh, lesions in the mid and far periphery and non proteation patients too. Ultra wide field angiography also helps us understand that diabetic retinopathy can be isolated to the posterior pole, as you can see this image on the left, or be exclusively in the periphery. Clinical importance of wide field imaging for DMA. Well, Shizalab's case's uh, beautiful study showed us that uh, he looked at uh, uh, peripheral ischemia and the presence of DMA. And he found patients with peripheral retinal ischemia had 3.75 times increased odds of having macular edema compared to those with that tint. And this brought about, kicked up the question of using targeted uh, peripheral treatment of, uh, for persistent macular edema. Ultrawide field also has brought up this concept of targeted retinal photocoagulation where ischemia show, shown so beautifully in uh, all around can be targeted with retinal photocoagulation instead of our conventional PRP, which destroys normal tissue also. Multicolor imaging is another imaging modality which I tend to use quite often. Uh, it is SLO based, it's available on the Heidelberg systems, three component wavelengths, blue, green, infrared. The confocal technology, because it captures reflected light through a pinhole, the image is less affected by reflected light or light from outside the focal plane. Also because pupil is less of an issue here, what you get as a result is a high quality, high contrast image and keyword here is contrast as opposed to a fundus flash photograph where uh, you can get a lot of blur blurriness because of uh, backscattering from reflected light. Uh, so as I said, the simultaneous scanning with infrared uh, laser, which portrays uh, pathology of the deep tissue because of the long wavelength, 815 to 820 nanometers, the green laser, 514 to 580 nanometers, uh, highlights infraretinal pathology, and blue, uh, 486 to 480 nanometer, uh, picks up superficial pathology. So in a case of DME, uh, serous elevation retinal lesion edematous retina shows up as a greenish uh, hue uh, on the multicolor composite image. Hard exudate surgery and rings, retinal stride, as you can see, is shown up very well. And with serial anti of therapy and progressive reduction on resolution of that macular edema and some fluid, you see that the greenish hue gives way slowly to the reddish hue and to the point where there is a complete restoration of the retinal, reddish retinal hue. Also, see that the hair degrees have also reduced. Uh, Microperimetry is another imaging modality uh, which has been used for case of DME, not very really often, but uh, it has. And the Maya system, which is uh, a macular integrity assessment, uh, what it does is it uses the SLO based system and it projects the retinal uh, sensitivity on the fundus photograph. And it uses SLO technology, as I said, as well as a very high level of retinal uh, uh, real time eye tracking. So uh, studies have shown that macular sensitivity correlated to uh, OCD macular thickness and equity trends, and that uh, lowered macular sensitivity correlated to CNP areas, drill, atrophy very well. Finally, multifocal ERG, another imaging model used largely for uh, macular uh, dystrophies, has also been used in DME, locally. and uh, we've seen that the macular edema on the multifocal ERG shows up as abnormal shape of the MFERG traces, decreased amplitude, delayed latency for long times. Once the edema resolves with all these you know, different modalities, uh, the normal, uh, normal C is restored. So in summary, fluorescent angiography, yes, it's a bit on the back burner, but it's very really good in showing up still macular ischemia, leaking uh, microaneurysms to which focal accurate laser can be done. And, and uh, confirming suspected NDEs, ultrawide field angiography does show up peripheral ischemia beautifully, as we've seen, uh, new vascularization, especially in the periphery, allows us to do this targeted retinal photocoagulation. Multicolor imaging is 
great marker for pathology and prognosis. It's a one step, uh, a part of a one step multimodal imaging device and uh, the Heidelberg system, therefore, incredibly time efficient in busy clinic. Uh, Microperimetry, multifocal ERG, because it's, uh, 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 it, it, it's a very objective tool, great for functional assessment of the macula and for macular edema too. Thank you. Thank you, Anand, for those wonderful pictures and uh, uh, a very, very nice presentation indeed. Uh, now I would, uh, you know, invite myself to talk on OCT and OCT angiography in diabetic macular edema. And thank you, Intas, for the opportunity. This is a 55-year-old male patient of mine, uh, a diabetic patient on chronic renal failure and hypertensive. Visual acuity was only 2 by 60. Uh, and all we could see on examination of the fungus were these studies today. But at that time, we had a time domain OCT, and it revealed a severe foveolar thinning. So we extrapolated that the foveolar thinning was due to chronic renal failure and macular ischemia, and he advised no intervention. But it was very tempting to laser the hard exudates. This much of retinal thinning is not going to improve. So this particular patient opened my eyes to the uh, magnitude of use and potential of OCT, which could be a game changer in the way we manage diabetic macular edema patients. Now, why do we need some biomarkers in OCT in diabetic macular edema? It's because there is usually only a modest correlation of visual acuity with the central retinal thickness in diabetic macular edema. The CRT was what we used to assess mainly when we saw the OCT in diabetic macular edema patients. But now we need some biomarkers because the CRT doesn't correlate with the visual acuity. Now, secondly, eyes with there are a lot of eyes with poor visual outcomes, though the macular edema completely resolves. So we need to understand why. And also, even in the same patient, there is a highly variable visual acuity in association with a given degree of retinal edema, even in the same patient between both the eyes. And therefore, in diabetic macular edema, it is important for us to understand that macular thickening might just be the tip of the iceberg. There are so many other things which we need to understand. Plus, there are a lot of shortcomings of fluorescent angiography in diabetic uh, macular edema, like the delineation of all the microaneurysms and the hyperpermeable retinal capillaries in the deeper layers. DCP is not possible. With understanding of the pathology of diabetic macular edema, we have come to understand that the deep capillary plexus is in fact more important than the superficial capillary plexus in such patients, which unfortunately fluorescent angiography cannot image. At the same time, there's a lot of leakage in edema, so the FAZ size cannot be delineated clearly, which is also important. And also the serous macular detachment cannot be delineated by fluorescent angiography, again, due to leakage. So there are several prognostic markers in OCT in diabetic macular edema. There are about uh, 10 of them. I won't be talking about retinal thickness map, which has been talked about time and time again, and also not much on microaneurysms because everybody knows about it, and epiretinal membranes because they can clearly be discerned. Of course, I will be talking about these hyperreflective dots, subretinal fluid drill, and the uh, cysts, and the ELM and the EZ reflectivity. Now, first and foremost, the most important OCT biomarker, I'll go straight away into it, is drill, which is disorganization of the inner retinal layers. It's the horizontal extent in microns wherein the boundaries between the several important layers in the inner retina cannot be distinguished. And usually the central one millimeter wide area of the fovea is what is analyzed for the presence of drill. And it has been clearly shown in the beautiful article by Sun, Eyal, and Jama that for every drill increase of approximately 300 micrometers from the baseline, Line, the visual acuity is reduced by one line at eight months follow-up. So to tell you more about the drill, we all know that the retina has 10 layers, all of which are beautifully imaged by the OCT. Let me spend a little more time. This is a beautiful spectral, uh, uh, the uh, swept source OCT picture of the outer retina. And this is the external limiting membrane. And this is the ellipsoid zone, which was formerly called the junction between the inner and the outer segment of the photoreceptors. And this is the myoid zone. And this black area or the relatively hyperreflective area is the outer segment of the photoreceptors. And of course, this is an interdigitation zone and this is the RPE group membrane complex. Now, and this is the inner plexiform layer and this is the inner nuclear layer and this is the outer plexiform layer and this is the outer nuclear layer. So drill happens when you're not able to see this morphology. 
and uh, please remember the morphology which I have told for the outer retina also because I would be talking about ellipsoid zone hyporeflectivity as a marker of poor vision and diabetic macular edema as well. So these are two pictures. Here you see there is no drill in this portion. You can see the two white lines with the black uh, area in between, whereas in this portion there is drill. In fact, the extent of the drill is about 570 micrometers here. So, uh, and if you see, this is a magnified view of that. And in this uh, patient, you can see that despite the presence of a huge cyst here in the outer nuclear area, you see that there is no drill. The inner retina remains intact. There is no drill in this patient. This is a magnified view of that. So these patients actually do very well and rest respond well patients don't have, who do which who, which don't have drill uh, the initial uh, examination they do very well with anti vegf agents uh, this is uh, one such patient of ours and uh, you see that uh, there is a huge outer nuclear uh, cyst which extends up to the inner nuclear layers and but just next to that there is uh, there is no drill and the patient responded very well to anti vegf injections and you can see that there is no drill here also I, next, I pass on to the most important, uh, uh, you know, OCD biomarker, the hyperreflective dots. It's always better if you want to image the HRDs, you switch to the white on black uh, mode of OCD to discern the, the uh, HRDs, which are seen as black spots better. And uh, this is a patient with, uh, this is from Ota, Ota Uji's article. This is a, a, a subfovial plaque, lipid plaque, and you can see that a lot of black dots here just above the external limiting membrane. In fact, a lot of hyperreflective dots in the outer retina are a poor prognostic factor and these patients don't do well at all. And these are patients, in fact, they have a subretinal detachment and not much of exudates, but still the OCT is able to pick up not much of hard exudates in the clinical photograph, but OCT is showing these uh, black dots, which are actually hyperreflective dots in the middle layers as well as the outer retinal layers. And how do you distinguish them from hard exudates? These are hard exudates. This is, a, this is a zoomed up picture. You can see that that is associated, big hard exudates are associated with a lot of shadowing. Uh, whereas you can see that these are some a few small high, high reflective uh, dots and there, there is not much of shadowing associated with that. Small HRDs like these actually are a bad prognostic factor. The subretinal fluid that you see is a good prognostic factor. Hard exudates and large High reflective dots actually are good prognostic factors. Epiretinal membrane, as seen here, is a bad prognostic factor when it comes to response of the diabetic macular edema to treatment. The other important one is the outer retina, the reduction of the ellipsoid zone, uh, reflectivity, as well as a disruption of the external limiting membrane. I showed you all that in my first uh, bl blown up picture of the outer retinal structures. You can see that this is a patient in which the outer retinal structures are intact, including the external limiting membrane and the ellipsoid zone. Whereas here, there's a partial loss in these patients. And here, there's a complete disruption of the ellipsoid uh, uh, external limiting membrane and a decrease in the reflectivity of the ellipsoid zone. All these are poor prognostic factors. So whenever we do an OCT imaging of a patient with adaptic macular edema, I request all of you to kindly not be swayed by just these beautiful pictures of this is a subretinal fluid and these are cysts. You can see that this is an outer nuclear cyst and these are inner nuclear cysts and this is vitro macular traction. All these are obvious findings, but you should also look at these uh, small uh, few hyperreflective dots which are just between the outer plexiform layer and the external limiting membrane. These are bad prognostic factors and these are moderate number of HRDs, 11 to 20. You can actually say few moderate and many HRDs. You should count the number of HRDs when we see the OCT carefully and scientifically in a patient with diabetic macular edema. And these are moderate number of HRDs between the internal limiting membrane and the inner nuclear layer. And these are several, uh, you know, HRDs all over uh, in all the layers. And uh, also, the uh, uh, external limiting membrane, whether it is continuously continuous, as in this patient, or partly disrupted, or completely disrupted, as in this patient. These are other things which we must look at. So we must look at the outer retina very carefully whenever we see the OCT of a DME patient. And whenever we have about four cumulative risk factors, like uh, uh, this is, for example, A is a large cyst, and B is, of course, uh, there is drill, and C, hyperreflective dots, and D, epiretinal membrane, you know that this patient 
uh, is not going to do well at all. So it's better to keep him, he or she informed at the beginning itself. And also OCT talks uh, has brought in a new concept called diabetic choroidopathy and something called choroidal vascularity index, which is still, I mean, a lot of uh, studies are, I mean, exciting studies are on the anvil on, on choroidal vascularity index, which is said to reduce with increase in severity of diabetic retinopathy. Coming to OCT and geography, it demonstrates uh, diabetic retinopathy findings like microaneurysms, arterial wall staining, neovascularization, as well as IRMA. But, and it has several pluses when compared to FFA in diabetic retinopathy. It's rapid, non-invasive. You see a 3D imaging. And very most important is you're able to distinguish between the superficial and the deep capillary reflexes, which is very important. And also, there is no leakage to confound the picture. So it's, it's, it's actually better in detecting non-perfusion and ischemia when compared to FFA. Of course, the minus is it cannot delineate all the microneurysms. So if you're planning a focal laser with a conventional uh, laser, then you might have to do an FFA. Uh, and also, as things stand now, due to the uh, non-availability of the non-wide field opta, peripheral CMP areas and neovascularization elsewhere not discernible. And you don't get any information on the blood retinal barrier status as such. So this is a fluorescent angiogram and the corresponding octa of uh, the same patient. You can see without any leakage, all the microneurysms are so beautifully delineated. And this is a superficial plexus. And this is how the deep plexus appears in octa. If you see the microneurysms in the dilative tasias and the non-perfusion areas, even at the deep capillary plexus level, so beautifully. And this is a very nice study by Lee Al, which talks about an OCTA marker, which can tell us actually that the patient is not going to do well with anti-VEGF agents. It says that whenever you, we see a lot more reduction in the flow density in the deep capillary plexus with an enlargement of the FAZ of the deep capillary plexus and more microneurysms in the deep capillary plexus when compared to the superficial capillary plexus, this patient is unlikely to do well after anti-VEGF injection. On the corresponding structure, I mean, uh, structural OCT, this corresponds to a disruption. Uh, the um, uh, greater loss of density of the deep capillary plexus actually corresponds to uh, a loss of regularity of the outer plexiform layer, because that, if you recall the anatomy, that's the watershed zone where the deep capillary plexus is actually located at the junction between the inner border of the inner nuclear layer and the outer plexiform layer. And hence, that uh, if you don't have octa, we can even look at the disruption of the outer plexiform layer. If that is there, then we can say that this patient is not going to do well with anti of agents. This is one such patient, that even after anti of agents, the subretinal fluid resolved, but the cystoid changes remained in this patient. Now, why does uh, the DCP, the deep capillary plexus loss, translate to anti of unresponsiveness? Probably the protein-rich intraretinous cysts also the ability of anti of agents to, dis to come from the vitreous to the DCP, as well as the abundant expression of wedge in the ischemic deep retina when the DCP is actually absent, you know, uh, restricts the efficacy of anti of agents. They don't know what to do. And also, of course, the rest absent or broken vessels might not be, you know, uh, it's not possible for the anti of agents to restore. And the DCP actually may be playing a very important role in the removal of excess fluid from the retina when compared to the superficial plexus, so which is why a smaller DCP would reduce fluid absorption. So even though the permeability is inhibited by anti of agents, uh, the, uh, they don't act that well. So this is again from uh, Lee's article. You can see that in this patient, the deep capillary plexus is very regular FAZ in contrast to an irregularly enlarged FAZ in this patient. And the outer plexiform layer is very much intact here, whereas partly disrupted here as shown by the white arrows. And this patient did very well with anti -VEGF. This patient has not done so well following an anti -VEGF injection. So you could consider steroids in such patients. Now, angioanalytics can also be done in Octa, wherein you can measure the non-flow areas in DME. This is one of our patients wherein you can, uh, currently with our machine, we are not able to measure the FAZ of the deep capillary plexus, but we are able to measure the non-flow areas of the superficial capillary plexus. So which gives us valuable information. In fact, uh, the FAZ enlargement is said to correlate with the peripheral ischemia. So if there is a large FAZ, you can predict that you know, the patient can have a lot of peripheral ischemia. This is important, especially in type 1 diabetics, wherein uh, you know, clinical findings may not be so obvious and more of peripheral ischemia is the rule in type 1 diabetics. And even interestingly, OCTA has been suggested as a marker in diabetics without diabetic retinopathy. Also, there was a statistically in, uh, significant FAZ enlargement when compared to control eyes uh, uh, in both diabetic retinopathy as well as uh, diabetic patients without uh, diabetic retinopathy. 
And this is uh, uh, out of curiosity, we have also done for some of our patients. This is a patient without diabetic retinopathy. This right eye of one of our patients, vision was pretty uh, okay. And this is the uh, left eye of uh, one of our patients. You can see that definitely when we did angioanalytics, the FAZ size was very much increased. The patient did not have any diabetic macular edema, but he was a diabetic for a long time. So in a nutshell, Okta does provide useful information, but limitations are, of course, at present, we don't have information on peripheral retina. We don't have information on legal cage and we don't know how to translate whatever information we have had to therapeutic decisions we are waiting for the vista algorithm and the wide uh, field octa to be widely available for us to you know uh, you know make use of this beautiful um, you know armamentarium more fruitfully in our management of diabetic macular edema so thank you once again for the opportunity and um, i will stop sharing my presentation and it's now my pleasure to invite Rajiv back again. And he's going to talk on something different uh, in this COVID era. What are the, uh, you know, uh, what care should we take regarding our diabetic macular edema patients? Uh, what about home monitoring? And there are certain myths he wants to bust uh, regarding the use of anti and steroids in DME. So let's hear him out. Over to Rajiv. Thank you, Vasmati. Is my slides, uh, you can see my slides. I am audible. Yes, yes, yes. perfect. Yeah, so this is a difficult word. Actually, uh, Vasubhati wanted uh, some topics and I suggested three of them. She said, why don't you talk all three? At the time is eight minutes. So let me try to do some justice on this. So myths, a home monitoring of DME and during COVID time. So home monitoring is something because now we are more working remotely, especially in Chennai and uh, this was something which came in mind. Can we remotely manage or monitor the DME progression? And we all know that we monitor it with the OCT. So our surrogate marker, what we are looking at is a central retinal thickness. Amsler, is it good to monitor DME? So there are a lot of literature and this is what uh, it suggests that it's very good for wet AMD fairly good for dry AMD CSR also it is pretty good. But if you look at the performance, in DME, it's pretty bad. So it is not a good idea to monitor your DME with the Amsler grid. And this was a nice study which tried looking at the sensitivity of Amsler is pretty low for DME. They gave another chart called as M chart, which is uh, metamorphopsia charts. And that was a bit better. And they also tried correlating it with retinal thickness. So definitely doesn't correlate with retinal thickness. Visual acuity because now we have a lot of these apps, the peak vision device, which can measure acuity at home, or now Stanford has developed one. So can we use them as a surrogate for retinal thickness? We all have seen through various trials that there is very poor correlation between visual acuity and central retinal thickness. So uh, for monitoring, we are looking at a measure which can give you some idea or correlate with the central retinal thickness, which is a marker which we use for treating. Uh, can color vision be used and color vision is again a functional test but this was a nice article which had used a different uh, panel called as SNU color vision test and they used a couple of combinations and they said that probably that is related to foveal thickness but again we don't use it in our clinical care today. One promising thing which was looking was not contrast, but a chromatic con contrast, especially the triton contrast, the TCT, triton contrast threshold. And uh, this group actually looked into another digital test called as chroma test. And they very strongly suggested that it is related to central macular thickening. It is related to logmar, but somehow this is the only publication after that we never saw this. So, uh, we really cannot say, and this is more recently, we have all heard probably Dr. Annette Stock of a home OCT, that is the natal, notal uh, device. It's called as Notal, the company. And they have made this, which she gives to the patient and they measure the thickness at home. Probably this is a more better, uh, a more structural test, which would be ideal to monitor DME. So best home monitoring device would be probably a mix of a functional test and a structural test. So these are just some food for thought. I, we really don't have a very clear answer how to monitor DME uh, from home. Now coming to the second part, myths. So these are actually, I will be just supporting with the trials that 
the myths and what is actually the trial telling. So one of the myths, some of our old timers still have that, that anti-VEGFs cause visual gain, but still laser is the best in macular edema. And definitely we have very strong evidence and I'll give you evidence which all of you have seen multiple times. That is the protocol I, which had on the y-axis, the change in visual acuity x-axis at the time of follow-up and the arm of laser, this is the outcome at one year, 52 weeks, that was the outcome point. And you see the rapid, the difference between ranibizumab and laser. So there is an enormous difference. And you combine it with laser along with it, or you do a deferred laser, still this uh, difference is there. And the effect, if you look at this two group, the, the deferred and the prompt laser, these two started differing from six months onward. And there it showed that alone ranibizumab is pretty good. Steroid did well initially, but then there was a rapid drop, probably because of the time they found that it's the cataract, it increases cataract. So that's the reason in this study, they didn't find it. So what is the role of laser in a center involving DNA? Usually we talk about non-center involving, it is definitely important. Especially if there's a good visual acuity, you can still sometimes think or a minimally, again, this is something center minimally involving with a good vision or extra foveal location or contraindication to uh, intravitreal approach of anti-VEGF steroid. When you cannot give, probably you can think of laser. Second myth is vision gain is not sustained for a longer time. And we do know the same study, the five-year follow-up, it did sustain to a, uh, the vision gains to sustain for even fifth year. So, and sometimes you should also consider near vision. Sometimes you may not be seeing only, so this is one of our data where we showed that uh, along with distant vision, the near vision also improved over a period of time. Uh, Another myth is anti vegfs are not so effective. It's now three years follow-up and still edema is coming every time. And many trials have shown us that every year the treatment burden reduces. So it's not like second year, they will not need injections. They'll need even in the third year, even in the fourth year. That's something and irrespective of agent, it's not like it's only one, anything you use, it will require multiple injections over a period of time. Uh, so there is no magic number of three. That's something you should remember. Another myth is combining laser will reduce the number of injections and it will give a better result. Again, this was the restore study and it had this green one, which you see down, that was a laser group. And after some time, the anti were started. So they also showed improvement. So it's not like it doesn't show improvement. Does uh, it reduce the number of injections by combining laser? So Retain study showed us that no benefit in, in uh, reduction of this. So again, coming back to role of laser, non-center involving, combination with anti-VEGF definitely has no benefit. Rescue treatment, you can consider it in a non-responder. Another myth in untreated eyes, if the intravitreal injection are started late, the effect is less. And in previously lasered eye, the effect of anti-VEGF is less pronounced. And again, that is not true. If you look at the subgroup analysis of rise and right trial, which had a crossover. So they had a sham group. Very less trials have got a sham group, but uh, this trial had, and they did show that even in the sham group, the uh, when, once the anti-VEGFs were given, the response was there. Even in a laser dye, it's never too late to give intravitreal injection. The same uh, thing we got from restore trial. All anti vegfs are same in DME. Again, protocol T tried looking at this, though in year one, they did uh, uh, find some differences. So if you look at uh, this and the year two, that differences went away. So long-term, it seems to be same. However, in their subgroup, they did find that those who have a poor vision and those who have a thicker retina probably Lucent is an ILEA fare better as compared to Avastin. So I think that is something we learned. Treatment with anti-VEGF improves edema, but basic pathology of diabetic retinopathy remains unaffected. And now actually across many trial, RISE, RIDE, protocol IT, all of them have shown that it also reduces the, there is a two-step improvement in retinopathy levels and that's maximum seen in patients who have moderate to severe NPDR. So it does change the, pathology to some extent. This is just example 
of patients who had so the fellow i was not treated which continued to worsen and those who were treated for dme you see there is a, a stabilization of the level of retinopathy even if there is a good vision but if the foveal contour is not maintained it's a center involving dme you inject that's one of the thing but again very clearly protocol v has given this answer that they had a arm where they injected a group where they did laser and the third group were, was observation and they found that all act same that is plain observation is better if the vision is 20 25 or better this is a two year follow up regarding steroids there are certain myths that can i predict iop rise by a topical steroid provocative test and some of people use it but this is one of the good article which suggests that the sensitivity is very poor it's only 25% so definitely not a good idea to use a topical steroid provocative test to know whether he will be a steroid responder or not so what we should look for there are multiple factors so the most significant ones are prior history of glaucoma or ocular hypertension following a previous injection uvi test hyperopia to some extent but these factors you should look for rather than uh, Uh, looking at the other things this was one of the myth which i had when we when i started injecting steroids that dex implant at month 3 macular edema is increased but i still see a implant so whether i should reinject or not and i always used to say it will increase the steroid inside and if you look at the pharmacokinetics it's you no know, major majority of the drug is gone in initial first 2 months so after that even if that uh, Uh, the envelope is remaining drug will not be there so you can if you at third month after a steroid you see that there is a increase in edema you can go ahead reinjecting it and one of the thing that iop rise if it is not seen in first 3 4 days after a steroid uh, usually happens at 4 to 6 weeks and this is one of our study uh, which was published in retina that there is a spike which happens at 2 weeks also so it's not necessary that Uh, if initial 2 3 days of your follow up the iop is not increasing it will not increase in a longer time and this is one of the myth people have best to use the best combination combine a steroid and anti vegf and protocol you did give us answer that there is no advantage of mixing steroid and anti vegf it has its flaws but definitely this is one of the randomized trial which gave us this answer uh another thing which many of um, like even at sn we used to follow that i prefer steroids in patients of nsd neurosensory detachment uh, thinking that it is inflammation but this is one of the study which actually proved that it is not uh, no uh, only study which actually proved this but it is not the case that uh, the uh, steroids will act better actually if you look at even anti vegfs lot of trials the good response of anti vegf is in those where there is nsd coming to the end of the talk the last part what are the changes in management of dme in covid time so i will not go about lockdown and we are now moved from avoiding anti vegf so when the lockdown was there and aioc asrs academy all of them gave a guideline that inject in cnv not in dme so we are now out of it so we definitely inject in dme however you should emphasize on a good metabolic control in my last talk i did mention that good metabolic control many of these parameters have a effect on the retinal thickness also yes dme with a good vision you can safely observe now whether to prefer a uh, anti vegf which is more durable is a query because we still don't have a approval of ilia for diabetic macular edema but that's something we will look for and if patient is on steroid and he is responding look for a iop response of the last injection because he may not be able to come again and again for a iop check and one suggestion is make your a uh, simple injection pathway so that he doesn't have to go on multiple places the same day oct is done he is seen and injection given so minimum time and minimum exposure thank you very much Thank you, Rajiv, for a wonderful talk once again. Uh, now I invite Anand to talk about anti-VEGF agents, which are which are the game changers in the management of diabetic macular edema. Anand.
Anand, can you share your slides, please? Yeah, we can see your slides. Just yeah. make it full screen. In the eighties, to uh, the current, the turn of the millennium, where intravitreal steroids held sway. Uh, to the current era of the anti VEGF prime rate, uh, namely Babasubar, Branizumab, and uh, Eflubicet. My screen doesn't seem to be moving. Yeah. So uh, the approach we're going to take is look at the current basic principles governing the AME treatment factors to assess and then how to strike. So from the trials, and Rajiv has stolen a bit of my thunder here, Rizal showed us that Ranizumab had high efficacy uh, versus SHAP unequivocally. But then uh, there was this issue then with all the other previous standards, laser and IVJ, as to how we were going to uh, place our, uh, Ranizumab or anti of therapy amongst all this. And the DRCR protocol, I gave us a lot of uh, teachings there. So it showed us that the random laser combination is better than laser alone or IBTA laser. Also, when in combination, deferring that combination laser was better than prompt laser. That's the two-year equity uh, plot of protocol I showed us. The combination arms did decisively better than laser alone or IBTA prompt laser. And amongst the combination arms, uh, the deferred laser did better two years, three years, and five years down the line too. And uh, uh, even with macular edema reduction, we saw that the deferred laser arm did better. Uh, early intense treatment tends to reduce treatment burden later. Very often people hesitate from, you know, going very aggressive with uh, uh, macular edema, diabetic macular edema treatment. They do it, they're not so hesitant for a CMU treatment. But it's important and protocol I showed us that very clearly in the pro combination arms, that in the first year, with eight and nine injections, number of injections required subsequently, two and one and three and two, was significantly lesser. And up to 43% of patients required no ranitumab treatment in year three. Higher safety issues were noted for the previous standard of care, which is uh, transnormal steroids, in terms of elevated intraocular pressure, as well as uh, uh, cataractogenesis, more than half the patients going to cataract surgery. Rice and right, uh, as Raji was also touched upon, it's never showed us that it's never too late for anti of treatment. Very often, again, you find people, you know, saying that macular edema has been there for a long time. Would it make a difference if I were to try it? But you should, because uh, Rice and Rice shows us very clear in this plot that for patients in the arm, in the white line that you see, right at the base, it hardly gets off that baseline for two years. And the moment these patients were allowed the anti of treatment, you see equity starts improving. And uh, same likewise with uh, the macular edema. Moment these patients were allowed anti VEGF, the macular edema started resolving. And uh, same thing for Resto, which shows also the same thing that uh, in laser only eyes, also it is never too late for anti VEGF treatment. Chronicity is not a, such a big deal. And uh, the plot shows us that for those patients, in the, as you see in the blue uh, line, uh, Hardy gets off the baseline for 12 months. But then once they are allowed uh, an that treatment, it's not snaking up, and that three years it catches up with the other combination arm. So it, the other corollary here is that it doesn't seem to make a difference whether you add that anti vegf and at the start of the orange line or one year later as a green line, at three years you end up in the same place. And uh, the extension arm showed us that adding a uh, uh, laser didn't reduce the number of re-injection rates, which was purportedly its USP. Bolt and uh, Vista Vivid showed high efficacy for Bevacizumab and Ephelbisept. And DRCRT showed, compared these three uh, drugs, which is Nidhidhar, and the two-year study showed us that there was higher efficacy noted for Ephelbisept, Branizumab, compared to Bevacizumab in the poorer vision patients, less than 20 by 50. It also showed, told us unequivocally that of the three, Bevacizumab reduces macular edema at least. 
Looking at the regimens, monthly dosing, XPRN, feet and extent, monthly dosing is obviously not practical, it's expensive, it's not feasible to keep doing that. The number of uh, chances of uh, complications can also increase. PRN was uh, a dosing regimen looked at strict equity and OCD-based criteria. The number of visits were a little higher. But in the Western world, people have moved towards treat and extend, uh, where they treat when the macula is flat, and then extend the follow-up by two weeks, till the point when it recurs. So retail was the first study which looked at comparing uh, treat and extend and PRN, and they found no significant difference across the treatment groups. Looking at the guiding principles clinically, what are the factors to assess? Clinical profile, obviously, first up, fundus picture, OCT, FFA features, and the best corrected equity. That I need to also look at the fellow eye. We need to look at the systemic profile, rule out masqueraders. The dosing history of posology is very important. You need to know how the patient has been dosed in the last maybe four to six months prior to your seeing the patient. Patient factors, compliance, financial issues are also important. So I've divided these clinical factors into what I call the mitigating factors and the encouraging factors. Uh, mitigating factors being RPD generation, macular atrophy, thinning, subcutaneous fibrosis, macular ischemia, poor vision, which for me is less than equal to 3 by 60, loss of that ISOS integrity, chronic factors of chronicity like ORTs, drill, surgical factors like ERMs or BMT. This is there you can desist from a very aggressive treatment uh, regime, whereas if the encouraging factors are there like pure clean edema with or without subretinal fluid, suboptimal vision, 618 to 4 by 60, you can pursue a more aggressive treatment regimen. Examples of mitigating factors being uh, macular ischemia, uh, fibrosis, heart exams in the macula, uh, outer retinal tubulations, foveal atrophy, drill, and surgical factors, ERM, which are macular fraction and membranes. One should also look at the fellow eye. I think that's important. If the fellow eye is good vision, one again uh, desist from a very aggressive treatment regimen. With one eye, you might pursue more aggressive regimen. Systemic factors, uh, glitter zones, like I mentioned, can promote macular edema. You need to watch out for nephropathy, hypertension, anemia, stroke, throat, myocardial infarction, allergies. You need to rule out masqueraders, importantly, hypertension, actel, excellent retinoscisis. So the regimen would be monthly antibiotic injections until the patient is stable, which means equity or OCT unchanged for two to three visits. You need to wait and extend if you see those mitigating factors that I mentioned, or treat and extend, and inject all about two months. Uh, if it's stable, you can extend follow-up up to three months. If not, if it's unstable, you can go back to treating extent. So that is if the dosing is inadequate. If it's adequate and you still have refractory DMA happening, then you need to switch it, change the drug. Example, uh, a case of uh, DMA refractory Vivastin benefited from its eccentrics, and really the opposite has also been true. And there are a number of studies which have shown that switching the drugs uh, from uh, Ranuzumab from Vivastin has helped and also a few percent from Ranuzumab. Elderly with the fakes, intravitreal triamcinol, ozodex can be used. Ozodex, especially for vitrectomized eyes, and Boyer study shows that it's, this is one drug which will work only in uh, uh, post vitrectomy uh, DME eyes. I mean, this is the only drug that will really function with the same pharmacokinetics. And the MEAT study showed that it is also useful in cases that are refractory to anti major cases. And uh, there are additional benefits to be had of repeated anti vegf therapy. It can retard the uh, background diabetic retinal progression also. So for diffuse DME, you can go into combination therapy. And in combination, you can defer laser, laser standalone for non-center involving DME. Uh, for the surgical conditions, protect me. You need to rule out the masquerade, as I mentioned. And if not, there are other alternatives which have been tried. I personally haven't found it to be very useful. People have tried injecting at an increased frequency of anti-VHF agents two to three weeks, increasing the dose, using a drug cocktail, drug holidays, giving a gap, or even limited vitrectomy uh, with or without island peeling. Thank you. Thank you, Anand, for a wonderful talk once again. And indeed, anti-VHF agents have changed the way we uh, you know, deal with diabetic macular edema patients. For the first time, actually, we are able to talk about vision improvement rather than maintaining the vision of the patient. We are able to give something positive to the patients. Uh, now, I would talk about non-anti-VEGF armamentarium, what we have currently. Um, let me share my screen. Is my screen visible? Yeah, it is visible. Okay.
So I'm going to talk about what are the other things that we have with us uh, apart from anti-VEGFs, which are the first line of treatment in diabetic macular edema, especially center involving DME. So the other things what we have are steroids, laser, pharmacotherapy, and when everything fails, vitrectomy. So first about steroids. Several caveats uh, which say that, you know, steroids actually uh, should be considered more often in diabetic retinopathy and diabetic macular edema. Number one, diabetic retinopathy is an inflammatory disease. And we can see that in the pathogenesis, we have this chronic subclinical inflammation. The caveat too, there is a rationale for the use of intravitreal steroids in DME because it decreases, they do decrease the paracellular permeability and improve the tight junction integrity. And so many anatomic, physiologic, as well as the biochemical factors which cause the DME are modified by steroids. They are affected by steroids and steroids have both an anti-inflammatory and anti-VEGF action and in fact the goal of therapy for DME is to reduce blood and is to reduce inflammation and restore blood retinal barrier patency so steroids do both. And caveat three, intravitreal steroids have been proved in several trials to be efficacious in DME Placid, Champlain, Mead, and Bevordex trial, which, which definitely proved that intravitreal steroids are efficacious. And we have the Illuvian, which lasts for about three months, and FAME studies have brought about very good results uh, with Illuvian. Uh, and this is uh, from the FAME study. And uh, you can see that, um, you know, very good reduction of a very stubborn uh, macular edema patient who did not do well on monthly anti VEGF injections. And the caveat for the anti vegf therapy for diabetic macular edema itself has several pitfalls. A DME patient definitely has an increased predisposition to systemic adverse events or SAEs. And uh, in, in both patients, uh, in, in DME patients, especially when you compare to di diabetic patients without diabetic retinopathy, you can see that definitely the incidence of cerebrovascular and cardiovascular disease is much higher. So, and these are the patients for whom we are going to advise anti vegf injections. And uh, you and we all know that VEGF has a very important neuroprotective and angiogenic property. And so we might be, uh, you know, putting the patient at risk for silent ischemia and silent heart attack if we block the development of collaterals and thereby increase the risk of systemic adverse events by repeated injections of anti-VEGF agents in a DME patient who is already predisposed to a greater degree of SAEs when compared to the non-diabetic macular edema counterpart. And also, it is, all, it is also theoretically possible and has been seen in certain clinical situations that anti vegf therapy worsens macular ischemia by causing vasoconstriction of the macular capillary bed. And also short duration of action, so uh, monthly or two, two monthly injections. And it's also proven in several studies and also our clinical experience that anti vegf agents alone are insufficient in over one third of uh, patients. Uh, and you can see that this is the protocol I, one third of patients, they showed persistent edema and this is protocol T, the diabetic DRCR protocol T, 34%, uh, 42%, and 64% of the different anti uh, patients continue to have a macular thickness of more than 250 microns at one year, despite receiving 10 injections. So anti vegf agents have several limitations. Probably the chronicity of the DME also limits the functional recovery, which is possible after anti vegf injections. So, and also the drug levels could be fluctuating in the vitreous and probably pathogenetic mechanisms other than VEGF might be working in that patient, which could result in persistent DME. So whatever it is, so an alternative is necessary. So it all started with triamcinolone acetonide in a diabetic macular edema and as DRCR and several studies showed that in the long term, it didn't do so well when compared to focal laser. So now we have a very elegant dexamethasone implant, which does not cause that much pressure, right? when compared to trimes alone and also lasts longer for, for uh, though the pharmacokinetics are highly variable from two to five months. This is one such patient of ours, absolutely unresponsive to laser and anti vegf and did very well with Osludex. And the intervitreal steroids actually effective in all types of DME and the IOP increase, which happens is usually amenable to topical treatment. And tachyphylaxis, which is the bugbear of anti vegf agents, is not much seen in steroids and it's safer systemically. And so what are the indications to put everything together? Indications of steroids and DME for approximately one third of patients who don't respond to anti-VEGF therapy. When the patient has an increased risk of thromboembolic events or a recent history of stroke within the previous three months, or during a previous anti-VEGF injection, if he had experienced a systemic adverse event, 
pregnant women with DME, it, steroids could be a better option, intravitreal steroids, and also in vitrectomized dyes, because anti-VEGF agents have a decreased uh, pharmacokinetics in vitre vitrectomized dyes, but no such thing has been shown for Ozudex. And very important indication of steroids in diabetic macular edema patients is prior to cataract surgery, because if you give, which was elegantly shown by Amod Gupta's group from PGH and Ticker as well, because the intravitreal steroid takes care of the urban gas component as well post cataract surgery in DME patients with better results. Coming to laser therapy, that was the gold standard ever since ETDRS showed us in 1985. Focal laser and modified ETDRS protocol was a gold standard. So how was focal laser done? And to all the treatable lesions defined by fluorescent and angiogram, the microaneurysms, the irmas, the diffusely leaking capillaries, and also the retinal avascular zone treat from within two disc diameters up to 500 microns of the macular center. The focal laser is in fact a better laser, uh, a more conservative laser, and that is a laser which I most commonly employ as a rescue therapy also. Uh, you can just place 100 micron burns over the microneurism once and then twice till the microneurism whitens or blackens. So that is focal laser. And there is also this grid pattern, which unfortunately causes a lot of sieve like photomas and not in much in use now, especially after the advent of anti of agents. You can, you can treat large areas of edema with 100 micron burns. But this laser really that SME by about 50%, but, but visual improvement was seen in less than 3% of cases, which is not good enough in contrast to 10 to 40% of cases, which show a very good significant improvement in best corrected visual acuity following anti of agents. And they have several side effects, like every standard laser burn enlarges by at least 16% per year for up to four years. So, and also the scotoma, and uh, if you're very aggressive, choroidal neovascularization and all that. So laser has been employed as a rescue therapy. In fact, in a significant proportion of patients with DRCR protocol T, uh, all these patients needed laser rescue therapy at one year. So there are several prospects that leads to it and good. And uh, so it is uh, better to uh, go in for a shorter duration micropulse therapy, MPLT, and uh, the, either in the form of a selective retinal therapy or a subthreshold diode micropulse, SDM uh, photocoagulation. And now the more popular subthreshold micropulse yellow laser, which is, uh, which is a better option. And uh, this is uh, from the subthreshold diode micropulse. You can see that the uh, you know, laser marks are not discernible on the retinal photograph but the edema has very very nicely resolved in both the pictures you can see these are the pre-laser and the post-laser pictures and the yellow laser for the subthreshold is actually said to be a better option because there's a big option of the oxy at the of the oxy by the yellow laser and also there is lesser pain lesser scattering so lower energies can be used when compared to 532 and there is of course negligible sample absorption so uh, it's very safe for the macula and also excellent penetration through the cataracts because it's got a longer wavelength than 532 so that is what is uh, the exciting uh, new thing which has come up and of course the pascal laser you have refinements like we have the endpoint management in the pascal using the yellow laser now as well as a wide field angiography guided peripheral prp is also said to help in the treatment of diabetic macular edema because it reduces the peripheral VEGF burden and the VEGF reduces the VEGF upregulation over time. And the very, very exciting uh, uh, Navilas, which is navigated laser photocoagulation, this is a machine wherein uh, real time, uh, the machine, uh, you can decide where the laser spots are going to be placed and the machine places uh, the laser spots beautifully as seen here. Coming to pharmacokinetic therapy, several drugs are really, uh, available. I will not go into all of them for want of time. Anti-TNF agents like infliximab have been tried. And there are several uh, new, new drugs on the horizon like Fovista, DARPIN, uh, AKP9778, etc. Among the systemic drugs, renin angiotensin blockers, anti receptor blockers have several they can be started on your patient after consultation with the physician. And phenofibrate and start. Let me dwell a little more on that. And uh, Amud Gupta's study clearly showed that oral statins in type 2 diabetic patients with dyslipidemia 
definitely reduces the severity of heart exudates and the subfovial lipid migration in CSME patients. So if there is a center involving diabetic macular edema with a plaque of heart exudates, we can try both statins and phenofibrates. If there is just fluid and increased CRT, statins probably don't have much role, probably phenofibrates. And in non-center involving uh, uh, systole macular edema, clinically significant macular edema, hyperlipidemic drugs might have a role. But essentially, it is always good whenever you see a patient with a subfovial plaque, a lot of heart exudates, and also dyslipidemia, you can start the patient on statins, which are more favored by the physicians. Phenofibrates have several side effects like myofibrolysis and all that and muscle pain. So the physicians are usually reluctant to start on phenofibrates, though they feel that the ACCORD studies did show very good results in reduction of central retinal thickness with phenofibrates. Of course, many times we just do this uh, combination therapy, and this is one such patient, uh, combination therapy, slowly he started to improve. Um, so combination therapy of anti vegf injections, steroids, focal laser, we try everything. When everything fails, vitrectomy. Now, why vitrectomy in macular edema? Because you are able to release the abnormal vitreomacular adhesions. You eliminate the free and the bound VEGF loads with improved diffusion of oxygen. And uh, when you do, you like in this patient, for example, obviously the macular edema is secondary to traction. So you detach the posterior hyaluron and feel the ERM, and you can also feel the internal limiting membrane also. But forced vitrectomy, if you have to inject anti vegf agents, you have to watch out for the uh, decreased half-life and increased clearance. And uh, you can use uh, triamcinolone or acetonide beautifully, and the membrane in the diabetic retinopathy macular edema patients just comes out like a beautiful uh, sheet like this. This was from our study in IJO. And uh, there is uh, the indications for Pascana vitrectomy in diabetic macular edema with abnormal DME, with abnormal vitreomacular adhesions in the form of a taut hyaloid or vitreomacular or vitrofovial traction or epiretinal membrane. And even after we do a vitrectomy, sometimes there can be a taut ILM syndrome. So we go in and peel the ILM again. Or even without abnormal vitreomacular Adhesions of the DME is not responding to entry pre surgery, and this is uh, post surgery. And this is, uh, uh, you know, an uh, controlled PDR with vitromacular traction. This is pre surgery, and this is post surgery with a very good vision improvement. This is another patient who had a fibrovascular proliferation TRD complex, the suprotemporal quadrant, and, uh, you know, cystoid macular edema with a very high risk of de roofing of this, leading to inner lamella hole formation. So this patient also needed vitrectomy. And this is a macular hole with vitromacular traction and uh, did very well following vitrectomy. And this is a vascular epiretinal membrane, you can see here, with a cataract after phaco vitrectomy, he went on to do quite well. And this is, a, this is the, of course, we've done uh, quite a few vitrectomies in patients who did not respond to anything. This patient did not respond to focal laser, five anti of injections. So this is pre-vitrectomy and post-vitrectomy, but obviously the visual activity was not so great because you can see that the outer retina continued to be very thin, but at least the edema became more manageable. And uh, this is, again, one of our other patients who was little better. Uh, he had, in fact, undergone 12 anti of injections and did quite well after vitrectomy. So the bottom line is whenever we see diabetic macular edema patients, there are several factors to consider. The most important is, of course, retinal thickness. We have to quantify it, but we also have to assess macular perfusion, which is very important. And also the vitreomacular interface has to be carefully studied, which is very important to look for any adhesion, whether it is detached or there's any traction. And also mind the peripheral retinal ischemia, which may be contributing to the diabetic macular edema and treat it if possible and also control the systemic status uh, so that you're overall able to manage this patient very well. So thank you very much. Uh, once again, uh, all of you for joining in this, for joining for this national webinar on diabetic macular edema. And uh, I will stop sharing my slides. And I invite my uh, co-speakers to come on board again. And uh, we have, of course, exceeded our time. So I think we can have about 10 minutes of uh, uh, a fruitful discussion. Uh, that's what the INTAS people are telling. So, so we can have a good discussion. Now, I would just like to know whether there are any uh, questions from the audience. So we will just check that yeah. meanwhile. So there's one question uh, for I think Mr. Dr. Henry has asked, you know, is the limited field of view is it a concern with octa and leakages are not seen? So FFA is still a gold standard in early PDR. So yeah, 
as we've mentioned that you know okta is a technology in evolution and of late uh, the swept source uh, okta and uh, from zeiss lexelite and other technologies are coming in everybody with every you know every six months the the barrier is being pushed back and they've been able to get a large wide field okta too but yes uh, this is i mean for the moment uh, for peripheral pdr even for pdr as such Uh, the gold standard for establishing a PDR uh, early on it would still be uh, uh, fluorescence fluorescence in angiography, especially if it's not very obvious. So, like I mentioned, uh, for obvious PDR, which you can see, where you can see the new vascularization, you don't need a fluorescence. But it's only for these obscure cases uh, to differentiate uh, peripheral new vascularization from in Irma that you would need fluorescence in angiography. Yeah, I think Amol has two questions. Amol, one K day. uh one he has a question nt vegf can reverse the ischemic changes to some extent indirectly he wanted panels comment and second was is grid a thing of past are uh, drcr protocols practical the reversal of ischemia is probably manifested by the fact that the diabetic retinopathy clinical picture does change as was beautifully uh, shown by anand and you the following anti vegf injections the dr picture diabetic retinopathy picture itself changes so probably the anti vegf agents do modulate the ischemia to a certain extent though no study has clearly put its finger on that and told us why uh, but then diabetic retinopathy itself um, you know is an ischemic disease from the start Uh, so it is uh, very difficult for us to clearly tell what role exactly does anti vegf uh, agents i mean uh, does vegf alone play in the pathogenesis of dme because there is this confounding factor of inflammation as well so i don't yeah. think there is a clear answer yeah. to the first question yeah. so not, not many trials in dme but we have a very clear evidence in vein occlusion so we have the copernicus and galileo trial for the ilia which has very clearly shown that it works for non ischemic and ischemic with a macular edema and brighter study and crystal studies with uh, ranibizumab that also showed the same thing so it does work in ischemia we have more evidence in vein occlusion yes i agree but what your thoughts are absolutely correct i would agree yeah. i'll just say add that you know there are there is a case series i don't remember exactly but from the german authors who showed that there is a bit of uh, reperfusion in uh, patients Uh, with anti vegf but is it the rule of the thumb is it an absolute uh, uh, i mean absolute dictum i'd say no we don't often see that it doesn't reverse but some cases does and just aside on uh, that uh, when sometimes even when you do when uh, we've done macular uh, grid photocoagulation we've also been surprised to see a bit of reperfusion happening so this is also the 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 uh, you know the uh, capacity of the macula to do that also when the vegf flow is reduced but to say that it will happen all the time i don't think that's true yeah maybe because diabetic retinopathy is a dynamic disease continuously affected by the fluctuations in glycemic level in contrast to venous occlusion which is a one time event usually yeah. any so any view on the grid for us to yeah the second question on grid any views like I stop doing now. grid. Actually, I don't like it at all. I feel it's a very un—I mean, not at all an elegant way of treating uh, diabetic macular edema. You're doing more harm than good. But with subthreshold laser, maybe uh, you know, uh, grid can be a, a good option. I mean, in a very, very limited yeah. way. Yeah. So I just add, we've had some experience with grid. First of all, grid for macular photocoagulation as a thing. I think that's kind of gone to the back burner of history. So uh, grid was. as it is as i mentioned for diffuse dme and nothing uh, works better than uh, non ablative uh, therapy like anti vegf therapy so uh, that is one second thing is a uh, lot of laser uh, marks we've seen these spots expand over time so even if in the immediate three to six months you you're gratified you feel good that you know edema has gone down uh, two years down the line we've seen cases where there's been a great expansion even with you know uh, the green laser so that is one thing uh, the second thing is uh, uh, somebody uh, referred to a sub threshold micropulse uh, yellow laser uh, the edex iq 577 uh, uh, used uh, quite a bit so it has been of some use but surprisingly in indian pigmented dyes we have not been able to replicate the kind of results that have been reported in europe and we believe it's probably because it's a non pigmented less pigmented eyes where it seems to have a better uh, result 
the parameters that they've used, we try to replicate it. We have to try to even up the power setting. So we use a 5% duty cycle. And uh, it's not just grid with subthreshold micropulse because it's not in the, it, it, it's so uh, less tissue toxic. You actually can paint the foveate. You can just go across it and you can keep doing that several times. And with autofluorescence, we've been able to show that actually it doesn't cause any RP damage. So, but even then, we've not been able to kind of replicate the kind of successful results that Eduardo Medewandana's group in uh, Padua have uh, shown us and even in the US. I think even Vikti Chong has done quite a bit on that in uh, uh, Oxford. But... Dr. Vasumati, just one question going to laser again that uh, uh, how do you, do you practice a targeted PRP? And Anand, your view also on that, whether yeah. do, you, do you still practice or you have, uh, have you changed the way you do PRP? Targeted PRP, I do only when the patient has not responded to the first three sittings of laser or the patient has come to me after undergoing laser elsewhere, where I don't really want to, you know, destroy the entire retina and do a fluorescent angiogram in case the, the new vessels are not discernible and then treat in and around the area of new vessels alone. And sometimes we have these troublesome new vessels close to the macular area. So in which case also a targeted uh, laser, uh, uh, retinal photocoagulation of those new vessels, you know, works wonders rather than, you know, targeting entire zones of the peripheral retina. Anand, Anand? your view? Yeah, yeah, so the issue I've always felt with the targeted retinal photocoagulation, for two things. One is for PDR and for DME. So laser PRP as such as we know can itself induce edema. That there's an upsurge of VEGF initially, and you know, one of the things we always, you know, when there is macular edema, we say do the nasal part first and then temporal to reduce that risk. So that issue is there, though I'm not seeing it that often. I don't use that one because it, A, the suggestion is that you need to do an optus wide field angiography to really make it effective. Uh, of course, you can do a fundus photo montage, but I don't think it's that critical. And uh, I guess it would be of a greater import in Western populations where visual field driving is very important. In our population, is not that critical, but it's again something that, you know, uh, it, we, we're going back with uh, fundus floors and with floors in angiography. So uh, the, the increasing our uh, dependence on that is not something I would, you know, very strongly advocate. But of course, in refractory cases, if I feel a fairly adequate standard PRP is not working and uh, there's absolutely no movement of that PDR instead of you know, repeatedly injecting, I would do a frozen angiography to see if there is one sector or some sectors which are grossly ischemic. Uh, and then I would you know target that. So I would use it kind of judiciously rather than a, a continuous uh, process. Of Speaking of, of uh, refractory edemas, quickly, one line definition. Rajiv, what would be your definition of refractory macular edema, diabetic macular edema? One line. There is no one line definition. <laughs> so if it is not going by any of your routine treatment, again, I will not label it as refractory. Refractory is a very vague term. Mm. So if a couple of injections and switching and your strict control and nothing is working, edema is less responsive. Couple of injections, not, okay. Yeah, so yeah. I will not give a number for it. But okay. definitely. So, so the short answer for that is for me, uh, you know, three injections, three months consecutive, uh, and it doesn't move, that macular edema so hardly moves by like plus minus 5%, then I would put it. So it's a, it's a big, uh, uh, I mean, it's a gray area, which is, you know, which is moving. For example, the Wilmer group will say six injections in six months. And only then will they even think of, uh, you know, other alternatives. Whereas generally the rule, the world over people look at three months or three injections, there should be some movement. Uh, uh, this thing. So one is uh, refractory from the point of being uh, not moving to say the standard of care, which is anti vegf therapy. That is when I would look for alternatives like switching or moving to steroids, as we've discussed. Okay. Just one Thank more. There was ten lines of answer. Last, <laughs> you know, last last question because there was an interesting one. When you use non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, both of <laughs> for both Anand and myself. Yeah, for okay. DME. So. Just prior to cataract surgery, in a patient uh, with diabetic macular edema, I would definitely start the patient on non-steroidal anti-inflammatory uh, drugs and uh, continue, obviously, for three to four months post-operatively, along with the uh, uh, pre-operative uh, intravitreal steroids. 
so that is the indication uh, uh, according to me for that and uh, the other indications i mean there is no clear cut you know um, uh, you know uh, evidence to say that non steroidal topical inflammatory drugs do help uh, in dme patients anand yeah so i also agree with that a perioperative uh, course of you know topical nsaids may blunt that rise in dme which you might see yeah, and then flatten the even, curve yeah flatten <laughs> the curve as we like to see now yeah. so that is one thing of course uh, people do uh, you know steroid in, uh, injections along with cataract surgery also that that's a different thing but uh, i mean i've been using historically you know for cases with very minimal dme where uh, observation doesn't seem to make a difference and uh, i have seen anecdotally that macular edema improving for example somebody is 966 parts i know drcr did put out a study and you i think you also showed that that it didn't make a difference over observation over a large number of patients but anecdotally i have also seen that and in some patients surprisingly you uh, you know uh, find that it might uh, it might improve oh, but and you I'm never know it has improved on it So yeah, yeah that's, that's why I've come to that. So I, if there is a patient with a high HbA1c or high blood sugars, then I would do nothing. I would just tell him to control everything. But if somebody is very well controlled and still has a little bit of macular edema, metamorphopsia, if you're just bothering him, then instead of sticking a needle into him repeatedly, I might first ask him, because you're not going to go blind with uh, you know, DME with a little bit of thing. I might just offer him this, and uh, people accept that very well. And then uh, you know, it might just buy him some time to improve. yeah speaking of hba one c uh, uh, before we you know run out of time uh, the post hoc analysis of rise and right clearly showed that you know the uh, the visual acuity levels of anti vegf is not exactly dependent on the uh, hba one c though later on we did have some other evidence emerging so if your patient quickly rajiv and anand if your patient had exceptionally high and uh, hba one c level say 11 would you be comfortable in injecting he or she with anti vegf Rajiv first. Definitely, we will still go ahead because we, as I told you, currently we follow the RBS, so our injection may not be a problem. But definitely, even C, I will ask him to reduce. That will, but it will not stop me from injecting. No. What yeah. about the visual results? Visual Is results. Your experience. Yeah, are um, definitely we also see that visual results may uh, not visual, but OCT thicknesses may not reduce to the level which we want. so definitely we will ask him to control but yeah. hba1c of 11 will not differ me from not injecting yeah okay because today uh, injection we give based on rbs not on hba but you yeah. still do see visual acuity improvements right yes, yes. Yeah. anand yeah. so i like, mean i think in this case you have to customize it again like i mentioned different scenarios hba1c with you know one eyed patient with a very high macular uh, elevation and decent blood sugar levels so with if he's hp i would say i would really then really need his uh, rbs or fasting blood sugars to be under control and i would refer say like i said again this is different from macular neovascularization cnvs where he can go blind in two weeks with that with even a 500 macular edema 600 macular he's not going to go blind he's not going to be devastated within two weeks so i will give him two weeks time to control Uh, yeah, okay. two different thoughts. And, yes. Yeah, and oh, I, mean, I would, I mean, you know, try to control. Like I said, I would. It all depends on whether he's one night, how how badly he's affected. Okay. If it's HP only eleven point six or whatever, with about three hundred blood sugars and just three hundred microns of macular edema with a six thirty six vision, there's absolutely no urgency to stick a needle inside. So I would wait. So DM is no, a different ball game from CMB. But uh, problem, what happens is majority of our patients have HP one C of ten. Mm, yes <laughs> so if we follow that that we give them a time to reduce because we do tell them that no, no, I, I, i would say hba1c is not the criteria i, I agree yeah. with what you said the fasting and the random sugars because yeah. we don't want you know to yeah, infection so yeah. I mean, that is more important and also yeah. whether he has nephropathy somebody with hba11 i would expect a half of them to have some level of nephropathy uh, so all those things uh, come into play absolutely so time flies and i think i'll just ask one last question which has always been bothering me both of you can take it up um is there any difference in the in the diabetic macular edema in a young patient when compared to an older patient or you could even think it think of as type 1 and type 2 diabetic diabetic patients is there any difference in the way you treat and the way they respond anand first 
Yeah, I, with respect to anti-VEGF therapy, I have not noticed any major uh, differences that can be, you know, highlighted. Uh, you can show me macleodema, and I won't really be able to say whether it's a young patient or an old patient, just looking at that OCT. So from a morphological point of view, I, I don't, I'm not aware of there being any real difference. Are you? And, and anti-VEGF is so powerful, so powerful, that uh, almost all the time it kind of is uh, effective. Yeah, I agree with him that not much differences are there. Probably some OCTA papers have recently come differentiating type A1 and type 2 diabetes having some differences in the, because type 1 will have more ischemic changes on angio OCT. Yeah. So those are the things which have come up, but it essentially doesn't change your management. Yes, one thing is type 1 diabetes, usually they will not develop much of macular edema. It's only those pregnancy during pregnancy, yes. they tend to yeah. develop macular edema. And that's what you should be aware about, that these pregnant ladies will have macular edema. And don't be in a hurry to treat with anti-VEGF in these. Because if it's in the last trimester of, your, of, the, of the pregnancy, the more after pregnancy, macular edema will reduce. Yeah, I agree. The difference is in the, Only in the early the uh, So early stage of the disease, young person, Pregnant. But is there any difference in the way they turn out the diabetic macular edema? I mean, does the uh, you know thick uh, taut hyaloid does it make play any role? Uh, Have you ever wondered? I'm, yeah, not in uh, like young and old. It's okay. basically, but when there is an associated proliferative changes, right. also that yeah. will play a more role. So, so if you have a bad diabetic in a young patient, you'd expect a little more hyaloid uh, toughness yes. because it's attached. Yeah. So those, it's the background features more than the more than, per se yeah. that makes a difference. So thank you all once again for joining. And uh, it was a pleasure having uh, both Dr. Rajiv and Dr. Anand, both stalwarts, uh, in this field with us today and uh, I'm sure the audience and myself and all of us have learned from each other's presentations and this uh, discussion. So thank you all once again and I thank, thank Intas also for this opportunity. Thank you very much and take care and stay safe.